This is Mario Andretti, and you are listening to Below the Yellow Line. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Below the Yellow Line. We have interviewed a variety of guests on this show so far, but I don't recall any of them being so multifaceted as Julia Landauer. Not only is she a race car driver, but also a fellow podcast host, hosting If I'm Honest with Julia Landauer. She's also a keynote speaker and appeared on the hit TV show Survivor. Thank you so much for joining the show today. How are you doing? Thanks so much for having me, and I'm thrilled to be here. Also, you have a very good podcasting radio voice. I, I love it. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I've had a few few other people tell me that. I, I You know you know how it is. You're, you're a fellow podcast host. I hate the sound of my voice on tape. You know, I, I guess it's not as bad when you're not the person that, that's not recording, but I don't know. I can't stand editing because it's just the sound of my own voice over and over again. Um, but that's just how it is. Um, but your start in in racing was was not necessarily unorthodox, but compared to some drivers today, you know, you didn't necessarily start racing at four or five years old like some of these other drivers. You came up through the Skip Barber Racing School. What was that like? What was uh, your start in racing like going through that program? Yeah, so I actually got started a couple of years earlier in go karting. So I was ten years old, so definitely late by a lot of standards. Um, but originally, it started kind of as more of a casual sport that my whole family could do together. My parents really liked that it was something where we could stay together as a family. They liked that they could work on the go karts and we could drive them, and they liked that it was co-ed and that their daughter it was two daughters, me, my sister, and then my brother. So they liked that their girls could compete head to head with the boys, and we were all good. And I loved it. And since I was the oldest, I kind of moved up quicker. And we had read about a guy who joined the Skip Barber Racing Series when he was 12. So my parents were like, oh, my goodness, if he can do it, our daughter can do it. And when I was 13, I raced for my first race for Skip Barber. When I was 14, I ran the full season and won the championship, which was super cool, especially being a girl going through puberty, like middle school, like all the super fun social stuff to be able to have this outlet with racing was really special. And um, continued formula cars for another year after that, and then switched over to oval racing and more NASCAR style. Well, you, you talk about making that switch, and that switch obviously worked out for you. Alpha Prime Racing recognized your talent, and they decided to put you in the 45 car at New Hampshire in, I believe, July of 2022. What was that first Xfinity Series start like? I've talked to a couple other drivers who have made their first start. They kind of describe it as... They're, they're excited, but you're a deer in the headlights. You know, you're, it's your first time going up against the big dogs of NASCAR, the second most prestigious motorsport series in the United States. What was that start like? Did you feel like a deer in the headlights? Did you feel like, you know, I got this? What was that first start like for you? Well, for context in the years leading up to that, so the last full-time season I had had was in 2020 in the European NASCAR series. And so, but it, that was only four race weekends. And before that, I had raced part-time in the Canadian NASCAR series. So I had had kind of only part-time schedules up until my Xfinity race. And I realized like it had been almost like a year and a half since I had raced competitively in a stock car. And it had been almost three years since I had raced on an oval. And I knew it would be really hard. I knew like I did a lot of video watching and physical training and talking with people and some sim time. And I knew it would be challenging, but I'm really happy I didn't know how hard it was going to be because it's a monumental task to jump in there, especially with so little track time before then. And again, at this point, we only have the 20 minute session. So I had a preseason or like a pre-test um, half day test at Motor Mile Speedway. So it was not at all similar to New Hampshire Motor Speedway or to um, a homestead later in the season. And I, you know, I get out to go practice and I'm getting up to speed and everyone is just shooting by me and everyone's up to speed really quickly. And I'm like learning my break zones. And, um, I remember being really nervous for qualifying because we have one lap and I hadn't put sticker tires on an Xfinity car before. And so it was really terrifying. And I remember I went out, I got up to speed. They told me that, I think they said in New Hampshire, you need to break at the one marker going into turn one. And I didn't do that at all in practice. So I was like, you know what? If they tell me the car will stick there, then I will try it. And I was so much faster than I had been in practice. And I actually thought I was going to get up into the wall. Kind of had the moment. And then, um, sorry, excuse my language, but um, had that moment. And 
I'm, I just like got into racer mode. It's like, okay, get it together, keep going. And I was able to get it going quick enough. And it was a small enough little mistake that I was able to qualify in on time. And let me tell you, I have never been so proud of qualifying 32nd place, but it meant that I made it like on my own with very little time. So that was really cool. The race wasn't great. We got taken out by all and, um, so that kind of, I, it was a solid day until that point. Um, but I'm really proud of, you know, what we were able to do up about till about halfway through the race. Well, you talk about, um, you know, you've never been more proud to qualify 32nd qualifying for a NASCAR race. Not many people know how hard that is. I certainly don't. I drove a go-kart for a couple of years, not competitively. And I, I had those, you know, oh crap moments every time I went around a corner at 15 mile an hour, but qualifying for a NASCAR race is so hard actually running and running competitively is even more difficult. So, you know, I, as, as somebody in the, I guess the, the media, I, I tend to rag on drivers from time to time said they make a mistake here. Oh, they shouldn't have done that, but I've never been in the driver's seat of a NASCAR race car. I hope I never am. Cause I'd be a hazard <laughs> on multiple levels. Um, but the fact that you made the show, I mean, you can say you're, you're, you know, in the top 0.1, 0.2% of all race car drivers in this country. And I think that's something uh, to definitely take some pride in. And after that, after, I, I believe you made one more Xfinity start that year. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So what, what, what track was that at? Was that Martinsville? My memory's a little. That was at there. Homestead actually. And also Homestead, I just want to stop okay. like, that is such a, I appreciate the way you said that, that, you know, that context of, you know, being able to make that race means that I'm in a certain level of racer. And that's a really gracious way to put it. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so Homestead was my second race. So that was in October of that year. And I was really, you know, they have to approve you to move up to the bigger tracks and New Hampshire was a one mile track. So that was the only one I could start on. And at that point in the schedule. And so I was really happy to be able to get a 1.5 miler. Homestead is really challenging because, you know, for listeners, if you're thinking about an oval track, instead of being near the wall on the straightaway and then turning down to the apex of the corner and going back up to the wall at Homestead, the fastest line is kind of around the wall the whole time. And so to be in the machine that was going the fastest I had ever gone, like 180, 185 miles an hour, it was tough to get up to the wall and I did not get up to the wall consistently, but I was analyzing all of my lap times afterwards and there was constant improvement. Like the gap to the leader from the start of the race to the end of the race just got smaller and smaller and smaller. So um, it was a really solid way to kind of end that. And, you know, I didn't know at the time that that would probably be my last Xfinity race, at least for a while. And so it was a really solid way to kind of close out that that chapter well you talk about being nervous to run the wall i get nervous running the wall at homestead or anywhere on an ascar video game as a dale jr fan i get so tense and so worried when he would just rip the fence and run an inch away i can't imagine that that thrill you're, you're probably a little scared but that's understandable um just trying to rip the wall at 165 160 miles an hour and you're not by yourself you know it's not a test session you got 40 other cars out there with you trying to run the wall and and, and trying to do that the, the exact same way you are so homestead is a track that i i love the racing there but if i had to get in a car there that'd be the track i would least want to drive at because it's it's terrifying to me and it's tough. Um, I, I i just i don't know how y'all do that willingly without a gun <laughs> to your head but you did it we somehow. did it and we you talked it. about that being your last race for a while, but NASCAR said, hold on, we're not done with you yet. We want you to come into the office and do some work for you. What is your new role at NASCAR been like and, and how did that deal kind of come together? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, I'm working and I started a few months ago, I'm working on the strategy and innovation team at NASCAR. So it's a really nice way to kind of segue into a different type of professional career, but still bring my expertise from my years of racing and, um, you know, my thought process to the team and try to help out how I can on, on the strategy and kind of the future, you know, looking forward for the sport. So it's really cool. I'm really grateful that they, you know, wanted to have me work there and that we were able to find a really cool place that allows me to stay close enough to racing without, being too close in a sense. And so it's an interesting balance. There are moments where I'm like, ah, I would love to be in behind the wheel still, but um, it's really cool to continue to be with a bunch of racing folks, but then also, you know, a lot of the employees who don't have an NASCAR background who are bringing really interesting perspectives. So it, it's fun. It's, it's definitely a new experience. <laughs> 
Well, it's great to have somebody that was in the driver's seat within the industry. And and I always love it when drivers are called up to the TV booth. We just saw that with Kevin Harvick, and, and they're on most every Xfinity broadcast when Fox does those races. It's always great to have the driver perspective, whether it be on TV, on pit road, or or in the office. Because, you know, you know some of these drivers personally. You know um, you know what it what it takes to to innovate the sport, move the sport forward in a way that uh, you know needs to be done to to meet this new generation of fans. So I think that's uh, it's valuable to have experience like yours on the track and then translate that uh, to an office somewhere. Uh, my next question, completely non NASCAR related, but you probably get this all the time. I, I, I'm not shocked at all. Um, no, I wouldn't be shocked at all anyway. You, uh, we talk about survival and attrition a lot in NASCAR, mm -hmm. especially at races like Daytona. You said, I don't just want to survive on the track. I'm going to go on a show called Survivor. You were on national television in front of millions of people, and I'll be honest, I've watched maybe two episodes of this show in my life. I have no clue what the premise is or anything. I just know it's a big deal when somebody gets voted off. I'll see that across my social media feeds, and I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. So probably not going to watch it, but <laughs> what was your experience on that show like it, i imagine it's it's similar to driving a race car there's still that competitive feel but what was it like being on national television not driving a race car but having to work with other people and and try to fight your way to the top uh on a on a show like that yeah it's there are a lot of similarities i think between racing and survivor um you know it, it it's still reality tv but it's very authentic and it's it's interesting because there's a strategy element which is the same for racing you know there's the physical challenge element like and competing that's similar to racing and then there's the perseverance and like i think something that i was underestimating going into the show was just how hard it would be mentally and how hard it is to be in a situation where you can't really trust everyone because you're all trying to win a million dollars and title of soul survivor. And so there were some of those things where as a 20 year old, I was the youngest person out there. It was that was new for me. And I had not been backstabbed much in life. And so like some of those things, I was like, ah, this is really eye opening. And um, some of the challenges were super fun. Um, you know, overall, it's just it's such a challenging experience. And we unfortunately, my tribe just did not thrive because it was fans versus favorites. So I like to say it's inherently unfair and it's kind of like putting a Hendrick car against a BJ McLeod car, right? Like it's just, they're not comparable. They're not, it's nothing against either one of the teams. It's just that it's different resources. It's different experience levels, you know? And so it's, um, I was a little bitter about that and will forever be a little bitter about that, that it wasn't all new people on my season, but um, yeah, it was great. It's a cool group to be a part of. I've actually applied to be on it again because I'm like, okay, you know, that was 20 year old Julia, 30 something year old Julia would definitely do a better job. But then I watched some of the shows seasons on Netflix. I'm like, ah, maybe not. Like, I don't know if I can be that deceptive. I don't know if I can be that backstabbing, but maybe I could. I don't know. I, th I think I think that's the kind of show where in general and the kind of game where in general people with more life experience probably do a bit better on the whole. Um, so we'll see. CBS, if you're listening, always want to go back. <laughs> well, it's good good to get that out there. And, and I don't really watch Survivor, but I do watch The Amazing Race a lot. I'm not sure there's quite as much backstabbing going on there as on Survivor because yeah. the people there seem to be a little bit nicer. But I'm someone that likes to try to keep the peace. I'm not a, a very, I'm not a person that runs towards conflict. I'm usually running as far away from as I can get. I would get eaten alive on that show. I'd be gone on episode one is because I, I don't have the, the the mental toughness for it just knowing people are are all against you and there's not really even though you think somebody's your friend they're not i just i, I can't imagine going through that i'm glad you did so i didn't <laughs> have to and so so other people like me didn't didn't have to as well yeah um as a podcast host myself it's, it's always fun to have guests on and you decided hey i want to take on that challenge too again getting back to the multifaceted part you've done seemingly every job in the universe but when did you decide to start your podcast and, and how did that dream and, and that deal uh, come together as well great question so as you mentioned in the intro i'm a keynote speaker as well and basically i gave a tedx talk when i was at stanford and i you know learned that i really loved getting on stage and telling stories and you know helping helping to provide a new perspective that people could think about. And so in 2023, early 2023, I was talking with my agent about how we could, what the best medium would be to create more content that could complement my keynotes, you know, 
you know, where could people who see me on stage find more besides just my social media, more in-depth discussions, you know, kind of being authentic, being real, telling these really honest and vulnerable stories. So that's how it originally started. And uh, if I'm honest, was just trying to get to the ethos that I would be raw and honest and, you know, transparent with people. And then I started incorporating some guests because it's, as you know, it's really fun to talk to other people and um, started having those guests. And then I took a break um, as I was starting my job in November, just to give myself a little balance. And then I started in January with season two of If I'm Honest. And this season has been a little more, I want to say a little more casual, a little more about discussing things that are relevant to our day-to-day lives. So like I talk about how i built a great relationship with my siblings. I talk about, um, you know, uh, what were some of the ones that came out? I talk about just, you know, like what we did over the holidays and some of the things I learned and um, still bringing on the guests, but it's really fun. Um, I'm really excited for my next episode that's coming out. And yeah, it's a really cool creative process. And I don't know if you've only had guests or if you do any solo pods, the primarily guests. Uh, so I, my first guest was in, july of 2020 yeah july 2023 so i started the podcast uh, right after the daytona 500 last year and then i had my first guest and then you know when it rains it pours right so i i've had almost 50 guests on in wow. a span of what four or five months my email inbox is a mess because you know as many great people have come on the show there's also been a lot of not rejections but just people that don't respond so yeah you just you just got to keep asking same way with the sponsor when i was trying to get a sponsor for this show i i thankfully did i must have sent emails to 200 people um, oh yeah so it it it's a tough thing to do to get guests on your show because everybody's schedules are so different. Everybody is so busy, especially in an industry like NASCAR, where you know these people are at the shop every single day, including in the off season. So, um, that I, I really do appreciate people like you and everybody that's come on the show, though taking the time. Yeah, uh, and I've been able to talk to a variety of people. We've gone and talked to people like Mario Andretti and Larry McReynolds, and we've also talked to people that own short tracks across the country that are just trying to to make a living there and help that. So. Um, it, it, it is, cool. it's been primarily, yes, I guess, uh, over the off season now that the NASCAR season is about to start again. Um, it's going to be, you know, almost every single day. Um, I, I guess I like kind of being the, the talking head. I mean, maybe I talk too much anyway, so <laughs> it's a way to express that without annoying my family. I'm sorry. I've completely gotten you off. <laughs> You're track. You, good. Can go, you can go ahead and continue. But I think it's like to, to that point, it's like, it's a creative process and it's an, an outlet to be able to tell stories or to share your thoughts. And I think that that's really cool. And I think, I think audio storytelling and verbal storytelling is a really cool art to perfect. And, you know, podcasting is different from on stage, which is different from on camera, but it's, um, it's a really fun space, I think. And it's very challenging, as you know, like, you know, building up a listenership and sponsorship and all of that, you really are your content creator, but you also have to be an entrepreneur. And I think it's, uh, and I, I don't know about you, I do all my own editing. I do all my own promotions and captions and descriptions. And I work with a producer to like get it on the RSS feed, but I'm doing all the really time consuming work. And, and you know, maybe one day there will be people who I outsource to, but it's still my product that I want to make sure is exactly how I want it to be, you know? So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy lift, but it's really satisfying. Well, I like that you mentioned that, you know, you might want to outsource, but you, I mean, part of us likes doing it ourselves. Cause like you mentioned, you know, we want to make sure it's real authentic, especially, you know, the name of your show is if I'm honest, you know, you want to be honest, you don't want to have kind of the, this fake image, I guess. And, and that's something that's tough for, for podcast hosts. Cause you know, you want to be the guy that everybody likes, but I think it's also good to be raw, to be honest mm -hmm. and, and to be yourself and stuff like this. And uh, it's, it's really fun. It is time consuming. You know, editing is, I don't spend as much time editing as some of these other podcasters do. You know, I'm not editing every single millisecond of audio. We're trying to find every single cough or blip on the radar on the timeline. Um, but it is, it is a lot of work and, and trying to make thumbnails. I had a free weekend a couple weekends ago and I said, okay, I'm going to make every single thumbnail that I can this weekend. And um, it, Pile it up in one sitting. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's time consuming, but it's one of those things that is so gratifying because it's not just, you know, it's not people watching it. It's just creating something you're proud of. Right. And I, you can definitely attest to that. Uh, it's just w when people watch, especially considering how our show is, has exploded over the past year, relatively for, for a, for a small YouTube channel that had just over 300 subscribers at the start of last year. We're now at 
a little over 1200. So Amazing. it's gratifying to see, uh, to see your, I guess your, your baby technically, um, yeah. take off. Um, and especially yeah. when this is my main means of income, you know, it is nice to see, you know, I'm not buying Cadillacs or living in a mansion in LA or anything, but, uh, it's, it's rewarding to do something like this. Um, for sure. For sure. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked all over the place. No, um, no, it's okay. You talked about uh, your Xfinity series, um, your, your future. You know, you're not sure when you're going to race again, if you're going to race again. But as as much as you can, as much as you want to tell us, uh, is, is there a racing future or what do you think your racing future uh, could be? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think I'm I'm open to racing. My, my big shift in the way I describe it is that I no longer felt like it was serving me to just push at all costs to, you know, spend all the time trying to get sponsors all the time, you know, trying to get on track. Um, it just, it wasn't working out the way I wanted it to. And I, I felt like there was just more out there where I could be kind of prouder of the end result. Cause as you know, as you mentioned, you know, you make a bunch of pitches and you usually don't get responses or get no's and maybe you'll get a few positive ones. And so it just, I was, I was ready for something else. That being said, I love racing and it's so hard to watch racing sometimes. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, I want to feel that elation, the high of being in the car and, you know, what it's like to win. So uh, to your question, I'm totally open to going racing and I have the freedom to go racing. Um, but I would expect that it probably won't be really a lot right now. And, you know, maybe down the road, it's sports car racing for fun. Maybe my husband and I will get a go-kart and just have a go-kart for fun. You know, we'll see, we'll see. But um, I love the sport so much and I love the camaraderie of the racetrack and I love working with the team and I love, pushing myself pragmatically to get faster and faster. And so uh, I definitely, I expect I will be back in a race car and I hope it's sooner rather than later. Well, that's great to hear. And, and I, I like that you mentioned, um, you know, it, it's tough to watch when you're not out there. And, and I kind of feel the same way, you know, when, when, when I, I can't post an episode a week and I, I see somebody else posting episodes, it's not near the same thing, but it's just kind of that feeling of, man, I can't do that right now. And and these yeah. other people are, so it's, it's tough, but at the same time, I think you're still doing all right. I think you're still doing plenty of stuff to, to keep you entertained and, and, uh, I guess keep you on your toes, maybe not as much as driving a race car at 150 miles an hour, week in and week out, but, uh, there's still some thrill to it. I'm sure, especially working for uh, the sanctioning body, which is not something that all of us get to do. So thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being honest. Thank you for kind of, uh, kind of taking us, uh, inside the mind of, of Julia Landauer and, and uh, again, yeah, a very multifaceted person, but, uh, thank you for taking the time and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me on this show and, uh, appreciate your great questions and great <laughs> interviewing. This was fun.